Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Self Helpless. I'm Kelsey Cook. I'm Delaney Fisher. And today we are doing an episode on social conditioning, which is something that was voted on by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash self helpless. So if you want to be a part of the community that helps us choose some of the topics that we talk about on the show, go over there and uh, and join. It's such a fun place to be. Yes. This is coming out on September 6th. And again, you guys, the tour tour is crazy it's it's like every weekend almost for the rest of the year um i I, we're recording right now we're recording this in july but i hope that by the time september comes i'm not hospitalized from exhaustion because oh gosh so it's a lot of travel um yeah so next weekend i'm going to be headlining skyline comedy club in appleton wisconsin that is uh the 16th through the 18th and then Austin, I'm coming to you from Moon Tower, the Moon Tower Comedy Festival, September 22nd through the 25th. And then our amazing DC Helpsters. Um, I was supposed to have been at the DC Comedy Loft July 6th through the 8th, and which is currently right now, but I'm back mm. home and not in DC because their AC broke at the club. And it's like, a hundred degrees in Washington DC right now. And so, I mean, people would have just absolutely, we would have been like rotisserie chickens just cooking in the basement. So they had to reschedule my weekend. Um, so I, uh, my, my weekend at the DC combi loft is rescheduled for September 30th through October 2nd. So I am so sorry for the inconvenience you guys. And I hope that that weekend still works for, for you in DC. I know that some of you actually weren't able to make the previous weekend for um, scheduling reasons. So maybe you can make this one now, but um, yeah, please go to KelseyCook.com, get those tickets. That's what co- what's coming up this month. But again, it's like through the rest of the year. So I'm probably coming somewhere near you. If you go check it out. Nice. Delaney. Yes. How about you? Um, you know, if you are a service provider and you're looking to increase your revenue and the value of your offer and just up level your business all around, I do have a business coaching program. We are currently at capacity at the moment, but we are recording this in what? July. Yes, we are recording this in July. So if this is coming out in September, I do not know, but I interview um, one person a week for the program. So there's always an ongoing wait list and stuff like that. So if you're interested, you can find all the information at DelaneyFisher.com. It tells you what is included in the six-month program, a breakdown of everything, who it's for, who it's not for, what I help you with, and all that good stuff. Um, And I also have a podcast called Efficionado uh, for service providers as well, who you just, you know, you just want some free tips and practical action steps. You can find that there. Delaney knows. (laughs) Delaney knows best. Um, Okay, so we've got a great quotable today. Um, This is from none other than Mark Twain. It says, who? Who? Who's that? (laughs) It says, uh, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I love that. This is a perfect one uh, for this episode. This episode topic. Yeah. Yeah. And really just to reflect to make sure that, not to say that the majority is wrong all the time or anything, but just to reflect that you're doing things that the majority is doing because you actually want to do them yourself and because you actually think it's the right thing to do and feels good to you versus just because you think you have to or you should. So I really, I like that quote a lot. I do too. Yeah. It's a good one. Um, so Del, do you want to talk about the actual definition of social yeah. conditioning? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about, you know, how to understand social conditioning, the agents of social conditioning, the effects of social conditioning, and what it is. It's a process by which people of a certain society are trained to think, believe, feel, want, and react in a way that is approved by the society or the groups within it. So we all have some self-defined standards and boundaries, like the things that we refuse to do within our society, right? Who we want to spend our life with, partners, spouses, friends, family 
family, the goals we have in our life, what we like, how we make decisions, how we present ourselves to the world, um, even our standards and definitions of beauty. So all of these are being shaped by society at large. And it can be, uh, it can take a lot of effort to ensure that things are actually aligned with you as an individual and step away and think independently. Yeah, you know, definitely. I would also, in, I'm kind of surprised that this isn't on the list because the first thing I thought, well, I guess it, it does come later um, in this episode document, but like religion to me is one of the yeah first things that people get um, ingrained with, with um, how they are raised, what's happening in their family, what right. maybe the primary religion is in the area you live in, and that it's not until later sometimes that people take a step back and go, do I actually believe this? Do Absolute, I support this? Absolutely. Yeah, that's like such a good um, good example of it. I think we're like, we are indoctrinated in so many different ways in so many different settings. Yeah. What we're learning in school and why we're learning it that way, you know, different religious practices, whatever it might be. Um, but I, I mean, I grew up, I grew up um, in Christian and Catholic households, and I didn't even look into the history behind the religions until I was 18, 19. I didn't even think wow. to. I didn't even question it. It's like, this is what I've been told. This is it. Let's move on. And it didn't take, uh, or it, it took me being in a college class called like the historical Jesus or Jesus or something like that as a freshman. And it was fascinating to learn what was going on in the world and all that stuff. And I, Obviously, if you've been tuning in for the show for a while, I became a religious studies major because of that class and like just never looked back. It was yeah. great. But yeah, that's like 18 years went by. Didn't even think of, to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is it is interesting to take a step back and go, oh my gosh, these are, these are the things that I've just been doing my whole life because this is how society has told me I should do this. But, right. you know, maybe What's not what I actually like. Yeah, there's a, there's several quotes out there along these lines of um, uh, because we've always done it this way is the most dangerous line in the English language because things have always been done this way because it doesn't encourage any kind of questioning or thinking or changing or improving or, you know, yeah. ensuring anything is just or ethical. And I'm like, right. yeah, that's a, that's a pretty powerful one, too. Right. So here are some of the agents of social conditioning. This is from um, The Mind uh, Fool. Uh, so social conditioning, sorry, let me say that again. Social conditioning starts when we are babies and there are some people who help condition us from the start. So our parents, our teachers, our peers, pop culture, mainstream media, novels and movies, and like we were just saying, institutions like religion, education, um, Social conditioning works by rewarding behavior that is acceptable and punishing thoughts and actions that are not acceptable. So it also involves the repetition of the same message over some time. This forces young children's brains to accept it as the truth. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, you know, uh, I think for a lot of the stuff that I'm probably going to say on this, it's going to sound pretty negative when it comes to social conditioning. But of course, there's a lot of positives too, like your parents teaching you not to put your hand in an oven as a toddler. Hey, right. that's pretty good and necessary. Like, you know, don't do that type of shit. Right. Um, so it's not all negative. It's just, I think, building in like the questioning of everything, I think is really important, of course. Yeah. Um, and like some examples of social conditioning in your every in our everyday life, it's stuff like, you know, the, the color pink is for girls and the color blue is for boys. Like, wh who the fuck thought of that shit? You know, like, so who's weird. making these rules and stuff, right? Right. Parents teaching you how to behave at a relative's house or in public. Um, I, you know, the term, like, use your inside voice. Like, those types of things yes. <laughs> stick out. Um, meals in a day, like your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Whose rule is it that we had three meals every day? I don't know. Um, God, think of the food. Think of the food pyramid. By the way, how like years uh, later that got so dismantled. Of like, oh, yeah. this is so fucked. But yet we all were like, yeah, this is what you're supposed to do. I guess. And then right. I remember learning that in middle school nutrition class, and that you just then built your life around it without actually questioning. Right. Is this right? Is this? Does this feel right for my body? I don't. You know. 
Right. And it changes all the time, but it's in your health class and it's in a textbook. So it's got to be true, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Even teachings of personal hygiene, you know, how to, how to like, you know, take care of your body in certain ways. Um, Dressing for different occasions. This is a big one that is like, yeah, for me. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You don't say, (laughs) why can't I wear sweatpants to this outing? I don't get it. Woman who owns three outfits. Um, Yeah. And we were just talking about that on a recent episode about um, we were asking each other, like, how often do you wash your jeans? Right. Right. Because that's such I feel like that is not even necessarily like a a societal thing. I think that's like within your household that Mm -hmm. different households have different ideas of like, this is how frequently you should do. your laundry in this way, or this is how often you should bathe. I remember there was a house growing up on my block where they, their kids got a bath once a week. Mm. And like, that was just like the norm for them. And it's, you know, and then in like so many other houses, that's like, uh, like crazy. Right. Right. I remember, um, I remember being in somebody's house where uh, they really ran the household whole, they ran the household like it was a military base and i'm not saying that like it, it's just it everything was super structured the mm-hmm. chores the times the this mm-hmm. and the that um and then you know you go to a different house and it's like very kind of wax a day so cold like hey the dishes are piling up who's gonna do a man we'll do them tomorrow that kind of thing so yeah just even within your like a family unit the social conditioning could be very different oh yeah that was I mean that was my life growing up going back and forth between my dad and stepmom's house and my mom's house my dad and stepmom were so much more like not military but it was very structured it was very rules-based very manners heavy where it's like you clean your plate Um, you eat your vegetables, you do all the, like so strict. And then my mom's house is where we had the candy drawer and it was just like, kind of like do whatever you want. So I was always going back and forth between that. Yeah. I remember even being told it's like the social conditioning was the same, but the reason behind it was different. It's like (laughs) my, my dad would say like, don't do drugs. Drugs are bad just don't. And my mom would be like, don't do drugs because you might like them and have a really great time. <laughs> don't do drugs because they're expensive. Right. Like, the, they're trying to get the same point across, but you know, different reasons. Um, different yeah. Google maps routes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so think of social conditioning as being domesticated by the thoughts and beliefs of others. Uh, your implicit social conditioning directive. So like go along with the majority, don't stand out from the herd, don't challenge or rock the boat, don't question authority, um, go along, get along or face ostracization. Is that, am I saying that word right? I think so. Ostracization. I know that's a hard one. Ostracization. 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 Um, shut up and blend in, believe what you're told by your leaders and media and who are you to question anything? Like, mm-hmm. w- 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 exactly. Like, why do you think you have the right to, like the food pyramid thing? Mm-hmm. Who ha- who thinks they have the right to stand up to the FDA in that way? Right. Right. That's why, so that's go why like, yeah, those like bigger systems or just like even authority figures in general can be super problematic because they're either not getting questioned or people are afraid to question them. Mm-hmm. Uh, a whole bunch of shit. Yeah. Um, so to spot social conditioning from really wanting and believing in something, you must be open to awareness and to questioning, you know, questioning yourself, the society and everything you've learned to believe in. And you can do so by picking every aspect of your life and asking yourself all kinds of questions. So some questions you can ask yourself, why do I want what I want? You know, Ooh, ask yourself. Good question. Right. Ask yourself the purpose of wanting something. Is it something that you can't live without? Is it something that you need? Or is it something you thought you needed? Oh, my gosh. I mean, this this is a big one. Like, Huge. why do I want what I want? Would I want the thi- Would I want certain things if I was not raised in this specific society? Yes. You know? Yes. I. Uh, I think you can go through that with like every category of your life. I think if you're single, you can be like, why do I want a relationship though? Yeah. Like why specific? If if that's somebody who wants to like, but why, what, what do you value in a relationship? Um, 
you can ask yourself that in your career, something you're striving for. It's like, am I just striving for that because that's flashy or that's what everybody tells me I should want? Or do I actually want that? Right. And let's say, what if, what if being single was the norm in a society and being in a relationship was the weird shit? Oh like, my would God. You, would you still want it? Would you be willing to be ostracized at a party for having a partner versus not having one? Like yeah. that t- those types of questions. Like what if it wasn't cool to do the thing that's cool right now? Would you still right. do it and put your like neck out there to do it? Yeah. Did you ever see the um, the Netflix special by Daniel Sloss called Jigsaw? No, but oh I'm going to. God. We should honestly, we should do an episode on the I'm comedy special down. Jigsaw by Daniel is it a- Sloss. It is oh. life changing. It is so good. It makes you. It really does make you get intentional about your um, your romantic relationships in particular, nice. because the main message from it is like the biggest mistake you can make in your life is spending your life with somebody you don't actually want to be with Mm. or like that isn't the right fit for you. It's the idea of like, yeah, you know, it's called jigsaw. The idea that people will cram jigsaw puzzles in their life, like parts of their life and people in their life into spots that don't actually fit. Like if people were jigsaw puzzle pieces and you weren't so desperate to like be in a relationship Right. You would be able to see like, oh, this actually isn't the right fit. But people get because being in a relationship and being married and all that is such a societal norm. And we're told it's a goal and a thing to strive for that people will sacrifice what they actually want just to not be alone. Oh, so good. I'm it's definitely wrote it down. Special. I'm going to watch that. You know what I thought of? A little bit of a subject ch- <laughs> a little bit of a subject change. My tits, my boobs, my fake boobs. Oh my Would god. Would I want fake boobs? A, if I wasn't raised in a family where literally every woman in my life had large boobs. Um and I was wow. like the only small chested woman. And obviously, if, if, if boob jobs weren't a thing, I probably wouldn't think to want or get one, right? Yeah. Like th- that type of stuff. But it's so funny because you, um, at least I do, I start to question like, wow, did I really want them? Would I have wanted them if this wasn't a thing? Um, and it can be confusing trying to sift through like what you want for yourself and what you think you want. And I find myself conflicted because I do... I do like a lot of stuff that has been the result of social conditioning and there's stuff I really don't like. So it's like, (laughs) I'm always kind of like weighing those or um, there's a lot of things like in the modern world that I think are great, like a lot of modern medicine and stuff like that. But then there's also shit like, I don't know, a fucking fidget spinner that it's like, why, why, why are we doing this? You know what I mean? And it's always like very torn between the strides that we're making and also the fact that we seem to keep getting further and further away from like the natural order of things. It's a big, so conflicted all the time. Yeah. Do you still feel happy that you um, got a boob job? I love them. Yeah, I do. That's why it's so conflicted, right? Because I'm like, I love these things, but it's also like, wow, was I was probably conditioned to want them or not think that uh, my small boobs were good enough. You know what I mean? Right. But I really like them and I don't regret it. And well, that's what matters. Know, right. That you're, so, you're happy. Right. It would have so been bad like, if you had gotten them for other people, like for the wrong yeah. reasons and then yeah. actually not been happy. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think that like, with, yeah. um, skin, like with wrinkles, how it's so, it, obviously Botox and all of that in our society, it is such, it, it's so pushed in, in magazines and in social media that women aging is bad. Like fucking freeze it up, lock it up, smooth it out, like airbrush everything. And I wonder, yeah, if that wasn't a thing, if I would feel so much pressure to buy all this really expensive skincare and try to stay ahead of that curve of physically aging. Right. Or it's like if I was raised in a small boobed family where all the ladies in my life had little ones, would that have been something that 
I was like, oh, I want this because right. everybody else around me does. Or I'd have been like, eh, the world thinks every woman should have big boobs, but at least my little family is like, doesn't give a shit. So maybe that would have changed my mind. I don't know. It's so weird. So many different layers of this stuff. Yeah. You know? There's, there's been a big theme on, on social media that a, a lot of women, I think around our age are like, God damn, we are so happy that the um the fashion choice of really low cut jeans is out and that more like high rise mom jeans like curve love all that yeah that that because like everybody I think I, I can't I guess I can't speak for everybody but I personally felt so much pressure growing up to look like you know Britney Spears Christina Aguilera these like tiny mm. tiny Jessica Simpson that yeah. was what was put in front of us at that kind of critical age when you're like in right. middle school, high school and you're seeing all these magazines and these pop stars with like just teeny, teeny, tiny and like the tiniest, shortest pieces of clothing. And right. it just felt like a very hard beauty standard to achieve. But that was what the social conditioning was, was like, that was what you were supposed to strive for. It felt like. Right. Right. Um, a big one, I we've talked on this show about it before, is just, you know, pressuring women to have children. You know, that, that pressure is still very, very constant yeah. in or our get society. Married. Yeah, or get married or all the things, right? Put, you know, not take care of themselves and put everybody else's needs before their own and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, I'm ready for that one to really, uh, just fall off. Fucking, the fucking die place. off, man. Yeah. <laughs> fucking die a hard fiery death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, okay. This is another question you can ask yourself. How long have I wanted it? Yeah. Whatever the thing is that you're trying for, is it something new that you desire or have you always dreamt of achieving it? Um, mm -hmm. is there a specific person behind what I want? So what made you want this so bad? Was it a new real realization with a friend or family member? Was it out of an unmissable opportunity with a peer member? Did an idol inspire you? And then also, uh, what do I get after I achieve it? Do you get happiness, an everlasting bond, love, professional growth, personal gratification, prosperity, or are you doing it just for the sake of doing it? Right, right. There's so many questions. I feel like, honestly, I, sometimes I feel like I stray to the too far end of the spectrum where I'm questioning literally everything and I right. exhaust myself. I'm like, okay, right. I just, you know what? I have to, I have accept that this is the world that I'm in and that it is very contradictory all the time. Um, but I'm in even like looking into, um, I remember when I was trying to, when I was finding an engagement ring and stuff like that. And you were, you were around for that, Kels, yeah. when you were doing that. And putting a lot of pressure on like, okay, it's got, it's got to be very much ethically sourced. It has to be this price point. This is not, no, I, that's, this isn't good enough. I feel like every thing is a bad option. Wasn't finding anything I liked at a vintage shop. It was just like, okay, you know what? Maybe I don't have a wedding ring. Maybe I just am one of those people that doesn't have, a, and it just spirals and spirals. And so, um, I, th and even just checking up on like, Hey, you know, sending an email like, hey, can you send me the credentials that this is ethically sourced and stuff? I mean, it can be really exhausting trying to make the quote unquote right decisions in a yeah. society that has so many layers of issues <laughs> that it, it, it can, mm -hmm. I can feel kind of, um, yeah, like analysis pr paralysis with everything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what's that happy medium with like checking in with yourself and saying, okay, you know, this is a societal norm. Does this make me happy or not? But also, not getting so wrapped up in the fact that everything is kind of strange when you really think about it to the point where you just exhaust yourself and you don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. You're not like living your life because right. that spiral can be really tough, you know? Yeah. Um, the wedding industry, period, oh, is yeah. full of so much social conditioning, so yeah. much judgment, so much pressure, uh, crazy. I mean, it is judgment on steroids. When you are planning a wedding, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a judgment. People like, I feel like people walk into a wedding and suddenly feel like they're on a reality TV show where like they are judges of the wedding. And they're like, well, <laughs> you know, right. Cocktail hour lasted a little long and they didn't bring enough tray past hors d'oeuvres. Like everybody, right. it's so it's so weird. I feel like it's such an easy I I've found myself doing that before. It's so crazy. And I 
like I look back on my wedding and I'm so glad with the ways that we did not do the social conditioning of certain mm-hmm. things or like we chose not to have bridesmaids and groomsmen. Cause I was like, I'm 30. I, well, at the time was I 30? Yeah, I was 30. It was like, I'm 30. Right. I don't want to rank my friends. That right. feels gross to me. What right. is this? MySpace top eight? Like, I don't like right. that. Like, let's not do that to our friends. Let's just like have everybody be together and have a good time. And um, yeah, so many other things that we took a step back and we were like, okay, we kind of asked ourselves those questions. Like, why would we do that? Is that because that's what everybody does? Or do we right. actually feel passionate about that? And like, you know, I, I used to have yeah. a stand-up bit back uh, then about it, about like not doing the garter toss because I was like, that's fucking creepy. Like, I don't want my husband fishing up under my wedding dress with my dad taking pictures. Like, this right. is what? Like, why do we do these things? Why are we doing this? Because we've always done them, Kelsey. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I a, a part of how I try to make these decisions because there's so much about the society that is very strange, but I try to. I try to ask myself, if you, if this was the first time you were hearing about this thing, what is your gut reaction? Like, you don't have any other information. You don't know if other people do it or not do it. You're just learning about this tradition or this thing for the very first time. What, what's that feeling mm. inside for you? And also, I like to try to think of, like, when's the first time I did learn about this? And it's usually going back to being a little kid learning about something for the first time. Yeah. Like, I actually remember... Um, it's so funny that being vegan now, but I, I remember learning that the chicken on my plate was like an animal for the first time. Yeah. I had gone to a farm on like a field trip for the class field trip. I was like maybe five, um, maybe four, maybe actually younger than that. Went to the farm, came home. You know, I had like pet chickens. I did all kinds of stuff, came home and, you know, one of my parents made chicken and something for dinner. And I asked, like, why does this food have the same name as the animal I met today? And then they were like, well, because it's it is that animal. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's that. Well, it's not that particular animal. It's that animal's like cousin from far away. And like, couldn't explain why this was okay. (laughs) Like, I was like, so my reaction was so horrified that I had just been playing with this animal a few hours ago. And now I'm eating it on a plate. And I remember being so confused and so inquisitive about it. And my initial reaction was, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. This is not good for me. I, whatever. That was my first instinct. Whoa. And then yeah. You push it down, you push it down, you push it down because, hey, this is what this is what we eat and what we do. And, you know, you're, it took me decades to kind of go back to like, hey, I'm just going to kind of go off of my reaction that like this just isn't for me. It doesn't make me feel good. And we'll just call it a day. But going back to like those first <laughs> yeah. things when you first learned about something as a little kid, um, looking at everything with a fresh lens, if you've ever spent a lot of time with children, they bring up some really fucking good questions. Um, you know, yeah. I was a nanny and a camp counselor for a long time and all that stuff. And I remember driving um, one of the kids around like after school and she saw, um, you know, she saw a homeless man on the side of the street and she said, you know, Delaney, I don't understand why we let people sleep by themselves on the street when so many people have really big houses. Why wouldn't they just have him come in? And I said, that's a great question. In, and you're, yeah. you're right to feel confused by that. It is yeah. very confusing, you know, yeah. but like stuff like that, where it's like, yeah, nobody has a good, nobody has a good answer for that. No. Yeah. We've explained that shit away pretty fucking well though. Yes, we have. You know? Yeah. Um, and a- another few questions you can ask yourself, um, is this your goal or just settling down with what is convenient is there, uh, oh, sorry, if there was a possibility that you may not succeed in obtaining this, would you still go for it? How many times would you try it before you give up? Um, if no one were to, oh, shit, this is a big one. If no yes. one were to know of your accomplishments, would you still do it? Yeah, ask that myself every day. It's in my fucking phone. If you couldn't oh tell anybody God. about this, would you still do it? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> my job is so, like, telling people I'm doing this thing, you know, it's like you yeah. have to do so much promotion and all this stuff. And wow. Fascinating question. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, what are you willing to sacrifice for this? Yeah. And you know what? I would actually flip one of these on its head 
instead of also, or in addition to, if there was a possibility that you might not succeed, what if you were guaranteed to succeed at the thing that you truly want to do? Would you do it? Like, would you, would you shift oh. gears? You know, would you change your path up if you what? were guaranteed for it to work? You know what I mean? What a good question. Oh my God. There's so many people who hold themselves back from following their dreams Right. Because they're so afraid. They, they assume they won't make it. And so they're like, I don't even want to risk it. I don't want to go through the pain. I don't want to give up this cushy day job I have to pursue my artistic dream or whatever. But yeah, if you could tell somebody, no, I guarantee you that you will do what you love for a living if you give it a try, yeah. then they would. Right. There's no anxiety or feel, fear of failure. It's like, okay, yeah, pretty easy decision when you put it that way. Wow. <laughs> Good thinking, man. Uh, so much. I kind of constantly go between like thinking like, uh, I don't know if you feel this way, Kels, where it's like I go, I swing between everything matters and nothing matters all the time and try to get in the middle because it's just yeah. weird. The, what the fuck is all this? I don't know. <laughs> Can I please just have my commune somewhere? <laughs> You and that goddamn car. Why, why do we need cars? Why, why we don't need to drive or fly anywhere? Why don't we just? Why do we all just live <laughs> in a garden? Everybody's needs are met. We all can do the thing we love. Anyway, I'm working <laughs> on it. I'm working. On, I'm working on being okay. <laughs> You're a silly goose. Um, do you want to read the iTunes review of the episode? Yes, this is from. Jess Bro 81 v and it's got like six cookie emojis. I already love it. It says, I'm loving this podcast. I know this is a boring review, but I love listening to them and it gets me motivated. Not boring at all. Jess Bro, we Jess Bro 81 v we yeah. super appreciate it. Love the cookies. I feel like that's kind of a throwback from something. Is yeah. that like in the very beginning? We're like, just leave some cookies for a I review. Say, that would make cookies. us feel so good. <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, like, this is a good example of we love when you guys leave like amazing, detailed, long reviews. And we also appreciate like throwing some emojis up there and doing your like, either way, it really helps the show. Um, grow on the iTunes charts because it's, it's robots. Right. They just see like numbers. They see numbers of reviews. So c- again, if you haven't, if you've been listening to the show for a while, if you're a new listener, whichever, we would love if you left us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. And uh, Kels, any kind of uh, segments you got going on? Oh Lord. Um, trying to think I had, you know, I was just in New York city and, um, it just was really nice. I hadn't been there in like two years because of COVID. Um, and it was so nice to be back and just like be back in the clubs. And um, I had a real nice time. Although I will say I stand firm and being glad I never ended up moving there. God, mm. that city is just the weather is such a fucking nightmare. It was like it's a lot, like 60 percent humidity and like 98 degrees during the day and then one of the nights it just dumped rain and I had a show in Brooklyn and I was just like walking in the rain for 30 straight minutes and then I got there and they canceled the show and I was like oh well I'm gonna go fuck myself I was just like <laughs> take me back to my car man like I'm like I love the west coast that you like have a car yeah. but yeah so that was like a recent little trip and um thank you to the oh I met such sweet helpsters in Connecticut by the way again this episode's coming out much later like much after uh, the actual shows I did, but the, uh, the weekend at comics roadhouse in Connecticut, just lovely helpsters that came out. Um, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you guys. How about you? Um, I got my hair done, which, you know, on this show is a pretty big deal since it's really the second time in four ish years or longer. Um, but yeah, so that's, it looks so good. Go look on YouTube at Delaney's beautiful hair and our matching yellow shirts that we did it not did really it does so, feel so nice like it your head your head massaged and just like somebody brushing your hair i was just like melting like, oh my god malika's <laughs> nails are so nice and yeah. she's just so beautiful that i'm just like it's like asmr just to look at you <laughs> like, it just yeah. makes me happy to look at you because you're so beautiful it was it was very nice so yeah that's my that's my good shit Got my hair done. Um, Cam's 30th birthday is coming up this week. So I'm taking wow. him on a little date tonight. Oh, um, fun. He's, he's a very simple man. He just, he likes a movie and a beer. I mean, that's so taking him to, uh, oh gosh, one of the Marvel, one of the superhero things. 
Oh, okay, um, I'm so out of the Black, loop. Black Widow, a lady spider, right? I'm, lady assuming, spider. I'm assuming it's a lady who is a spider. <laughs> lady spider, lady trademark. I don't know. Maybe I should be the new um, spokesperson for, for Marvel movies. Lady Sounds spider, like probably. <laughs> I'm sure Scarlett Johansson yes, is that's that. stoked. Yeah. Um, yes. All right, guys. Well, again, head to KelseyCook.com and get those tour tickets. So many shows coming up. It's, like I said, pretty much every weekend through the end of the year. So head over there. And I can't wait to keep seeing you guys on the road. Absolutely. And uh, DelaneyFisher.com for business coaching and aficionado and some other resources. Oh, and I just thought of another question that I find could be helpful is like, you know, how would you live your life if you had like a handful of years left? You know, like three to five where it's like you still have to like make money, but you also have to live your life. What would you be doing that? I that's in my phone, too, for myself. I love that. So, that's a great go. question. All right, everybody. All we right. love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. Yeah.